So it's a quick updates. Uh, advisory. Established their team already. Um, if you guys have questions about that, ask Daniel. And for the uh, and then we uh, for the new project that's going to be like Project Horizon, we have uh, scheduled the founder meeting for next month. Things are kind of moving slow there. We're going to try to uh, pick things up, try to get you guys a new project. Um, but if if you're applying to advisory, but yeah, that's been going on in the background all week. Uh, yeah, give up to yeah, so uh, as we mentioned last week, we have a pitch competition that we are putting on completely from start to finish over at the Seed Incubator on October 20th, so that's rapidly approaching. Um, I guess right now what you'll see in the coming days are marketing information like flyers and interest forms for that competition. Uh, right now, just to provide you updates from you know within the team, we're looking for startups to or students with startups or startup ideas to enter into the competition and developing uh, with the seed and people over at the seed we're trying to develop a judging criteria, a holistic criteria as well as you know what the logistics of the event are going to look like, uh, the time of the pitches, the format and so forth. So it's really a, a start to finish um, brainstorming that, that we're ironing out right now. And yeah, I mean stay tuned. It's going to be exciting to see how it pans out. A uh, massive opportunity for us. Uh, in the community, in the Gainesville community. And the seed is also going to be marketing it on their end as well. So yeah, stay tuned and um, it should save up to be a pretty exciting event. Yeah. And then a couple of us yesterday went to Alchemy Work Club. This is a new, uh, relatively new work club that opened in Gainesville. A lot of new startups are popping up in there. Uh, this is like one of those things that like, if you guys heard of WeWork, it's like very similar to that. But um, they're actually like very, Imagine like an adult community center. That's pretty much what they are. Uh, startups are based in there. They have a coffee shop in there. They're open Monday through Friday. Actually, a really good ambiance in there. I went yesterday. PS27 was there. Uh, Abhishek actually works with PS27, and they were uh, they were there tabling. It's a it's a cool resource center. You guys should check it out. I would say the, uh, the membership. I don't know too much about the membership details, but if you look up uh, how can we work up online, you can find more information about that. Yeah, it was a cool event. Is that local to Gainesville, or is that a like large bread company? It's uh, local to Gainesville. It is local to Gainesville. Actually, my mentor is the founder of it. Um, really? His name is Andy Chavez. Uh, guided me through a lot. Um, he's worked in CoinDesk, had his own <coughs> startup, and he graduated here from UF with a master's in entrepreneurship. Really cool guy. Um, helped me do a lot. Um, yeah, uh, if you guys are interested, let me know. And like I said last week, sorry, we're, we're going to try to get to the content. I'm going to try to speed things up. But basically, last week, um, I like to, I want to provide more transparency to all of you guys, to show you guys what we're doing in the background. Um, these are our past completed projects. Uh, these are the ones in progress. Project Horizon is the, the new one that we have undergoing, which is very similar to Satin Atlantis. Not similar, like, company's not similar, but like the project style and like the, the the gravity of the project is very, very important. Uh, Santa Fe pitch competition, Project KVD is, uh, we're basically, me, Vinay, another associate of ours, Carl, working in the background um, as a liaison for Florida funders, trying to deal source and act, act like a venture scout for them. Um, so we're doing a lot of pre-seed evaluation and talking to founders. Uh, we're trying to source a lot of things from Tampa, Miami, and Orlando. Uh, but there's some really cool stuff at the end of that if we, act, we could actually deliver. A lot of cool things for Warren's Inventions, I will say. Um, but we're going to try to deliver as best as we can because what comes out of that is going to be very, whatever comes out of that is going to be really good for the club. And uh, yeah, so in the backlog is another project, a very, very big project that we have in the making as the founder meeting that I, that I mentioned. Uh, small business case competition, that's in the spring. If you guys are interested in that, just talk to Avi. Not here today, but um, yeah, just shoot him a message. And then we, we're doing a lot of BCIC planning in the background. Uh, yeah, I'll say for that. All right, guys. So if you guys have been tuning in for the last couple of weeks, we do a current event spotlight uh, on a startup in the public sphere that's coming to the public sphere. So this week, we're looking at ARC-1. So they recently raised $70 million in Series B funding from a bevy of investors, including Eclipse. The big name in there is Andreessen Horowitz, Lower Carbon Capital, and abstract ventures. 
Now, with that, they have raised a total of over $100 million to date. For some context, ARC-1 is an LA-based EV company specializing in battery-powered speedboats, as well as high-efficiency protective hulls. So those are kind of their differentiators in the market. And you can see the 70 million is pretty steep for an EV company that speci specializes specifically in boats. And this recent uh, fundraising has been specifically for them to break into the water sports uh, scene. So if you're looking at you know, wakeboarding, water skiing, et cetera, that's kind of been the focal point of what they're trying to do with this recent fundraise, which is kind of unique in the EV space, uh, considering they're so focused on uh, one type of vehicle, which is a speedboat. So some things to consider, some questions that we're going to open up to you guys to discuss amongst yourselves are first off, now, what does that Series B mean in the headline, right? What does Series A, Series B, and Series C and BC, what do those refer to? How can we connect that to the number, which is 70 million, uh, that we see in the headline? How do we connect Series B to 70 million and vice versa for the other um, fundraising sectors? As well, what are the implications of the entire EV market with this latest uh, fundraising round? So, you know, try to brainstorm you know, what differentiates ARC-1 and what also connects it with the broader EV market. And uh, do you think this valuation is justifiable for ARC-1? So take a few minutes for you guys to discuss amongst yourselves these questions and uh, come up with an idea if you want to share with Brad and else.
So yeah, second question, what are the implications for the entire EV market? This one is a tough question because it's a unique company that specializes in speed boats. So would anyone like to give this one a try? So based on last week when we talked about valuation, what do you think are some parameters? If you're going into this question not knowing much about you know, the comparables and so forth, what's a way that you can, you know, what's the initial research you can do into finding information about a company or comparables? I guess you can do like a relative evaluation. Like I forgot the exact name, but like I think it's called precedent evaluation, where you can look at past EV com past EV vehicle companies that have IPO or have gone through these funding rounds, and based off like comparing their like sort of whatever available information they are that there is on them because they're private, you know, that like seeing whether or not you know it is a justifiable like valuation, like. What the what this news means for the entire EV market? Now, I feel like for the second and third questions, we can only really give opinions here. We can't like give like hard based facts. Yeah, yeah, because we don't yeah. have that precedent. The point is to just get your mind thinking about valuation. Mm -hmm. It is a hard question. You know, none of us are experts in EV markets, but just trying to brainstorm and see like, are there other players that are, that are going to pop up out of nowhere? Are there Chinese players? Are there uh, European players in this? You know, it's just trying to think of ways of that can impact valuation, but also impact the entire EV market. Okay, anyone else want to uh, take a gander at any of these questions? It's all about putting these numbers within context. Yes. I think I think the valuation, I really like the third question. I think the valuation is just fun, just like looking at their their website and just like well, their positioning in the market. It's a unique positioning. They have a, a very they have a very solid product. And uh, the only thing I'd have to really, my only concern would be the team. Otherwise, they're positioning towards specifically West Coast, very high income consumer who's very environmentally focused. So I feel like if they can ex if they can successfully increase production to economies of scale, they'll be able to they'll be able to like succeed <coughs> successfully. Yeah, that's a great answer. Yes. Um, I'm on the lake a lot, so I've kind of researched the boating market before. I don't think they're going to be able to expand into the lake sports area because uh, Nautique, a uh, player that's already huge player in uh, just boating industry, they have the revenue backed by gas boats, but they're also developing a new EV boat right now, and they're starting to put it into production. So I just, I don't think they'd be able to compete against the technology that they already have designed and their whole design, like their weighting. Um, and the general technology that's already built into it. Um, and then the other thing is there's just a lot of speculation with batteries in the water, and if something does fail, um, it just could hurt a lot of people that are around you. Yeah, I like that answer. That's, that's kind of a representation of thinking like a VC, right? Blowing it down to the fundamentals. Yeah. Any question? Um, uh, that's really interesting to know about people with building a, an EV boat. Um, but I don't know, I'm thinking a lot with there, again, were a lot of concerns with EV cars too. I mean, 10 years ago, that, that was still very much up to debate, and it was, for a while wasn't really adopted. But now, now you look in, everyone's making EV vehicles. And I mean, if on the lake, and like, there might be competitors, but a Nazi boat is going to go for like, Hundred fifty, two hundred thousand dollars. So if they can find a way to differentiate themselves and make them more affordable, there's a lot of opportunity there. And I think it's overall, <coughs> um, the EV market's growing. It's growing exponentially, and it, I, it's, my opinion, I, I think there's definitely room for growth there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the last thing to note on what Greg mentioned about the high income market: one of these Arc One speedboats goes for roughly three hundred thousand. Right so. Yeah, that's currently where they sit now. Yeah. Um, a little pricey for a pitch. Thank you guys for that. All right, so on to the content. Uh, I'm going to try to get through everything. Uh, I have a lot of questions put up for you guys. Um, this is something that we're doing every week. I know it's a little cheesy, but whatever, it's just to show you guys like, what we're sitting at. Uh, valuation one last week was uh, relative valuation, where we talked about comparable valuation and um, Precedent transactions. Um, we were going to go over LBO, but there's just a lot to cover with DCFs. So I, I moved that to um, leverage buyouts. 
Alex uh, had a family emergency, so he couldn't come today. Um, but he should be able to, we, like, with the co-director curriculum now, John, you guys should be able to talk, in, uh, talk about starting a fund and then uh, leverage buyouts. Uh, so two weeks from now is when it'll be able to be coming up. Yeah, let's get, let's get into it. So this is what I showed up last week. This is just a quick refresher. And uh, just want to you know, bring this to your attention again. Keep this in mind as we're talking about intrinsic valuation. Um, it's still kind of the same. You're not going to be building a DCF for every single company you do. Um, you might do it for a handful of companies just to see. But really, you're at least in specific scenarios, you'll only be looking at one company. So what is the valuation? What is the market comparing the assets at? How can we generate comparability? And then how can we adjust for differences across assets? How do these companies differ? And what metrics should we use over the other? And then, yeah, just differentiation there. So like I said, here are the key steps. So we have key performance drivers. Those are KPIs, very um, specific to companies. Uh, we're going to project free cash flow. We're going to go over what that means. Calculate the weighted average cost of capital. Um, that's also up in the air. Um, I also give you some, some insight from my past experiences. Uh, determine terminal value and calculating the present value and determining valuation. So first things first, you gotta study the target. You gotta figure out what the business model is, what risk is associated with the business, what KPIs can you, can you hone in on this business on. Um, the financial profile, so that's how much debt they have taken on, how much ownership is divided amongst the shareholders, um, what are the end markets? Are they vertically integrated? Are they horizontally integrated? Um, that's like quarters by forces. That's pretty much what this left side is, just figuring out the, the positioning of this business. And then from there is when you go into the intrinsic aspect of the business. What are the internal drivers? Is management good? How good are they at generating profit? What is their growth pro profile? What's a reasonable terminal value used for this business? Um, you know, just thinking about like justifiable growth rates for this business. Does anybody know uh, how quickly the U.S. economy grows? About four percent. Four percent per year. Growth rate, nice, nice. Does anybody know how fast China is growing? Isn't it like stagnating now? It's like around two percent. Yeah, but let's just say like you know, eight oh. tiger move. Like how fast are they growing? Let's say that again. Like in the past 20 years. Oh, like 8%, like yeah, way yeah. higher. Average, average like 8%. They hit an all-time high, I think, a couple years ago, 14%. That's, you know, that's a booming economy. Would you say that a business could grow 14% in one year? I don't think so. Well, it depends. It depends you know, like, you have Apples, you have Googles, it, it depends. So, let's get into it. EBIT. What is EBIT? Earnings, yeah. Sorry, I, I have more questions than I just told you. Um, taxes. <laughs> Does anybody know what a marginal tax rate is? As you make more income, you're taxed at a different rate. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So what is that incremental tax rate that yeah. gets imposed? So then that brings you down to your earnings before interest and taxes, right? Depreciation and amortization this is something you learn in, in accounting. You, know, you buy an asset, capitalize it, but you need to, cap, uh, you need to capitalize the expense over a period of time. So that's depreciation. Amortization has to do with intangibles. So if the company has patents, um, trademarks, I think it depends. Some some intangibles aren't amortized. Um, that just depends. Also, a discount on a bond can also be amortized. That's very specific. Um, so capital expenditures, that's just investments. And then increase and decrease in networking capital. That's going to be a major point that we're going to talk about later. Uh, networking capital is very, very, very important for a business. And that gets you down to free cash flow. So some things you have to look at are historical performance, projection, period, length, and alternative cases. So you need to look at specific periods, how the free cash flow vary, and how it looks in future periods. So that's what we're going to talk about projection. A couple of things there as well. So yeah, uh, pretty much this is just telling us how to get down to EBIT. So you have your revenue. But when we're actually projecting, this is what we have to do. Does anybody know? how to baseline grow a company through the revenues. Just revenues. Like how do you grow, like, let's say today, we're trying to figure out how many cash flows Apple is gonna have in the next five years. If you were just like guesstimating, like a very basic forecast, how would you forecast Apple's future cash flows? This is a, an interview question, by the way. This is something that I got asked in my IP interviews. 
So just remind me. That's also what I want to preface. I did investment banking over the summer, and I was in the M&A group, and I built DCFs and OBOs. Just heads up. But these are questions that you'll get asked straight up. I don't know if a venture capitalist will ask you, but if you're interviewing for private equity, this is stuff you gotta know. What was the question again? How do you forecast revenue? You can look at um, you can look at like research reports and use those uh, forecasts for like the future. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you can look at past revenues. Mm -hmm. Do you know what that's called? <laughs> that's that's a good term. It's uh, you'll learn this in accounting too. Ex post data. So you're gonna look at ex post data historical performance, and then you're gonna get what we call the compounded annual growth rate for all those periods. This is what I have to do for banking. You get the CAGR, for short, the compound annual growth rate, and you take the average of that. That's a baseline way to project revenues, very basic. Does anybody know how to project COGS, like expenses? That starts getting fitting. But yeah, just want to bring that to your attention. It's not as simple as you might think. That's a very basic projection. And then on top of that, you have to defend how you're growing revenues. I doubt that we're going to be building DCFs for startups. Um, it just depends how late they are. But I had to basically build a DCF from a picture this summer. Like it was not, it was literally just a, a line graph. And I had to guesstimate how much money the, the company made. Like by looking at where it kind of hit the graph. Just off of that. And I could see something similar popping up like that in advisory. Just a heads up. Again, this is EBIT down to free cash flow, just reinforcing it. Um, I'm pretty sure we're all aware of this already. Uh, so, change in networking capital. Does anybody know what a current asset is? So that's an, um, <coughs> it's like calculated under a year. Yeah, exactly. It's any, any asset that you have under a year. And uh, what's current liability? You'd have to pay off the liability within a year. How would you define liability? Uh, it's money that you like, right? money that you would Oh, to come to someone else. So, so like, yeah, yeah. yeah. You're gonna say that? Yeah. It's an obligation. Liability is an obligation to pay back something, uh, to pay back an investor. So, for example, current liability is accounts payable. Let's say you're taking out, uh, you bought inventory on account. The basic accounting example. How, when are you gonna pay back that that company? That, that's when you open an accounts payable. When you don't provide the cash up front, it's accrued liability. Uh, you know, other forms of liability are bonds, obviously, as investments to the company, we're going to go over that as well. Um, but the major thing here is networking capital. So your networking capital is your current assets minus your current liabilities, right? And then to get the change in that, you get the current period's pre, uh, networking capital minus the last period's networking capital. Now I'm going to ask you guys, why do we subtract an increase in networking capital and a decrease, and vice versa? I want to hear from somebody. I know some of you have taken accounting already. Because we're calculating free cash flow, so if you have an increase in assets, you're paying cash for those assets. So an increase in your assets would decrease your free cash flow. Yeah, there you go. The way that I'll boil, down, I'll boil that down is to, if you guys, what you'll learn in accounting is net income and all of accounting is on an accrual basis. So what you're seeing in the bottom line isn't true cash. So what we're trying to do here is see how much cash this company is actually generating. How much, not just like, because accounts receivable, you can incur a revenue, but that's not really cash. That's just an expectation that you'll receive revenue. Same thing with an accounts payable. You incur that expense, but you haven't paid your cash yet. So we're trying to see how much true cash you have. That's the point for networking capital. So how healthy that number is depends on how the company is operating how successful management is at all. <coughs> so just keep that in mind. Net income is a cool, and then free cash flow is getting down to cash basis, like what the company truly makes. This is just uh, what it would look like. You know, this is crazy. You can build very simple DCFs. I wouldn't really see this. I wouldn't expect anybody to build this from scratch. Um, what you will be expected in interviews and stuff is to basically run them through this mentally. So everything that we've gone over, right here, you need to, basically in an interview, they'll ask you like, run me through a DCF. It's a very simple, it's a very simple uh, question that they could ask you. You'll have to start with EBIT. This is your operating figure, this is your operating income. You need to start with EBIT. There's other ways to get to it, but I will tell you that this is the simplest. 
then you need to have a free cash flow. And then we're going to talk about how to project free cash flow. This is a, as you can see, it's a historical uh, way to get down on leverage free cash flow, and then a way to get to projected free cash flow. We're going to go over how to project it, like more formally. But first, I want to talk about WAC. WAC is a weighted average cost of capital. So this is how much the company owes its stakeholders. Stakeholders include equity investors and debt investors. What does that mean? It means that the company has taken out X amount of debt and they've issued X amount of shares. What does this cost mean? I guess is my first question. What does it mean when a company issues debt and what does it mean that the cost of debt or the cost of equity? I want to hear from somebody else. <laughs> cost of debt. Cost of debt, cost of debt. I mean, how much it would cost to take it alone, right? Right. And what would that, like, how would you put that into one number? What would be your cost of debt? Um, interest rate. There you go. And your cost of equity? Anybody want to give that a shot? Uh, the return that shareholders expect. There you go. There you go. Perfect. Which is cheaper? Cost of debt. Okay. Mm -hmm. Why? Why? Why is the cost of debt cheaper? So at first, no, 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 no,
like I mentioned also, what are the impl implications of different uh, capital structures? Think back to the point that I mentioned, like publics. Think about, think about the mix of debt and equity they might have. Did you repeat the question? Sorry. What are the implications of different cost structures? So like, let's say a, person or a company has 90% debt, 10% equity. What could that mean? Uh, in that situation, the company would be over leveraged, but if it had like, way too much like equity, then they're, they're just not utilizing enough debt in terms of like, expansion and stuff. Yeah. Just uh, they have different risks associated with it. Might not be the smartest decisions to have that much debt. Or debt or. So, if a company were to have like let's say higher levels of equity with a pretty low debt, would that mean that they're not? Because I know usually you want to put that equity back into the company, sort of to like grow. So if they have like lower levels of it, would that mean they're not like investing? Like they're not growing essentially. You're saying lower levels of equity. Yeah. It. It depends. If all of the equity could be isolated into one person, and then a majority of like all the cash they have to operate could be debt. It could be coming from debt. It, it depends. Uh, let's say venture capital, for example. That is an equity investment. That's not a debt investment. So that company comes, or the venture capitalist comes in, and they probably have 10 to 20 percent. So that's diluted, and it ruins how much the true owner has on his return. But with debt, all you do, all you have is an, like an obligation to pay back this guy, unless it's convertible, but we're gonna go over that in venture capital. Um, unless it's convertible, then all you have to do is pay back that money. So it just depends. If you have too much debt, then you can't be, you have to, by law, you have to make those payments to the debt holders, so you're not reinvesting back into the business. So yeah, I, I would say like if they have more debt, they're probably not reinvesting as much back into the business. So uh, we already kind of touched on this. When and how do these companies decide to over lever or to uh, issue more equity? Um, I'm not gonna go into it, but basically you can put the pieces together. There's financial risk, there's operating risk, there's tax implications. There's also a tax benefit. This right here is the tax benefit. Your tax shape, it's one minus your tax rate. When you, let's also go back one more. So, like when you build an income statement, you get taxed on your earnings before taxes. So, how much your interest deducts from your earnings determines whether or not you get a tax benefit or a tax expense. So, interest is also one of the reasons why the cost of debt is lower than the cost of equity, because your interest lowers your taxable income. That's another benefit. It, it, the math works out. But yeah, um, that's one of the reasons. Uh, management staff, they're very risky. You probably don't want to be you know, leveraged up to 90%. Um, the nature of the industry, like I said, Publix, very low margins in grocery stores, depends. And whether or not they're actually good at generating operating cash flows. So how do we get the cost of debt? Or this is kind of moving back. How do we find the cost of debt? Well, if you guys want, we should wait. Do you guys want to get pizza? You guys get pizza. We can finish. Yeah, finish. Okay, you guys want to finish. Yeah. All right, so how do we get the cost of debt? There's multiple ways. I'll tell you the way that I did it over the summer. It's basically just you find how much debt they have outstanding. <coughs> Most of the times, it's several different types of bonds. There are several different types of notes. And you get all the interest rates. And you take a weighted average of all those interest rates, and then you just add it up. That's how you get your cost of debt. That's how I did it. But what I will say, and I want to practice very quickly, is that anywhere you go, or any place that you work at, they have their own ways of getting whack. So this is this is a, an objective formula, but it could also be very subjective. <coughs> like two summers ago, I did an equity research internship, and all they did, all, all they told me to do was put 7% for whack, rule of thumb when there's a whole methodology to actually get whacked. So I just want to say like, this is how you get whacked, but everybody has their own way of getting whacked, okay? Like I said, the current yield and the outstanding bonds, I didn't really do this method where you find all the, like you take a comparable analysis of all the, the yields on debt for other companies. I think it's just, that's, that's a grind. But if you really want like 
different costs of debt. This this is the way they do it. And uh, yeah, I already said the last one. Cost of equity. This is a really cool one that you'll learn in, if you're a finance major in upper level finance courses. There's a whole different der uh, derivation that goes into the capital asset pricing model. Um, and something you'll learn in business finance if you haven't already. Um, but this is, this is the way that we get the cost of equity. And for those of you who have taken business finance, what is the, what is the cap M formula? I think this is the, with Banco, this was the second, this was the second example. Yeah. It was risk. Risk of what? <laughs> this was a whole semester ago, right? Um, one minus plus, one minus beta. Well, think about what it is. What is it? It's a line, right? Yeah. So, it, I don't want to almost go. Sure. You know, That's as far as I got. Okay, okay. <laughs> so, capital asset pricing mo uh, model. What is it? It's this formula right here. Your cost of equity is determined on the risk-free rate. The risk-free rate could be a treasury yield. Does anybody know what it's sitting at right now? It's like, isn't it like, wait, the treasury rate? Yeah. It's at like four, four or five percent right now. Four, what is it? Four, four point, so like John, two. Isn't it 5.25? Yeah, 5.25, around it, 5.5, 5.25. Your risk-free rate yeah. is like, Let's say if you're super conservative, what amount can I invest to just generate a, a normal rate? Like guaranteeing like that I won't make this money. That's your risk-free rate. And it varies that I won't make a note. It varies on which country you're in. For the US, it's the treasury. The treasury bonds that the government issues. Okay? Your beta, this is leverage beta. This is the sensitivity of the company. And this has to do with public companies. You can't really do this with startup. But just for everybody's knowledge, beta is the sensitivity, how the company reacts compared to the market. Okay? So if they have a beta of one, it means that they're in line with the market. If the market goes up two percent, they go up two percent. Okay? That's because this right here is your risk premium. This is how much the company or the index makes net it out against the risk of the company. This is the risk premium. That's why if, if, if the market goes up 1% and this beta was one, they'll be like the, the return would be one. Or 2% or if it, sorry, sorry. A beta of two, then they'll double whatever the market does. But if they go down 2%, then they'll be negative 4%. Okay? Sorry. That's a good thing. Sorry. Another thing I will say is Leverage beta, there's a way that to also unlever that. This is, if I'm remembering correctly, this is your, your financial risk plus your business risk. So it combines business and financial risk together. But there's a way to only get business risk and financial risk. Okay? Yeah, it's this right here. So this was my favorite equation in business finance. It just it was very easy to learn, and it basically connected. There's like a whole like business finance problem that connects. Like the, the password professor would just give you unlevered beta, and then you'd have to go all the way to levered beta, and then plug that into your CAPM, and then plug that into Y. That was like a whole problem. But this is called the Hamada equation. This is how you unlever the beta. This is how you lever and lever up your data. So from business risk to combine financial and business risk, this is how you do it. It's your debt to equity ratio times your tax yield, one minus your tax rate, the marginal tax rate. And then this is just that divided. Same thing. Like just switching around the, the variables. And then what? The final whack equation is plugging in everything. Cap M, the average yield that you got in all the debt, and then plugging it into whack. Where is it? Yeah, there you go. Whack is right here. At the tax cost of debt, 
after tax means you get the yield on the debt that you, that you took already times one minus the tax rate after tax cost of debt times the percent of debt in the capital structure. So that's debt over debt plus equity. And then plus the cost of equity times the percent of equity in the capital structure, the same thing. Here's sure this is it right here. Yeah. There we go. This is a, a way that it would look in a model. We were gonna have a model prepared um, Building out this deck took a lot more time than expected. I, I want to try to get something out for the LBO. Um, just wait on that, I guess. But this is a, a WAP. And this is pretty much how it will look universally, any, any model that you look at. Um, so with all that in mind, imagine being in an interview and walking all the way where is it? from here. to here, and also talking about your WAC and your debt to equity, you don't have to talk about this. This is what you can talk about. Talk about how you're gonna get the cost of debt. Talk about how you get equity. The Hamada equation, remember that? Hamada equation. Hamada, that's that right there, the un re levering beta, levering and unlevering beta. And then the actual calculation of WAC, and then how you basically list it out. Depending on how finicky the company you're interviewing with, this is like they'll ask you for something like this. They might even ask you to build it on the spot. It depends. So, how do we actually forecast the free cash flow? There's two different methods. There's the Gordon Growth Model. You also learn that in business finance, or if you have Wall Street Prep. And there's a t the perpetuity. Or I'm sorry. The Gordon Growth Model is the perpetuity growth method, and then there's the exit multiple value or the term terminal multiple method. Okay. This is it could be subjective or it could be objective, it depends. You can find a relative terminal multiple by doing a precedent analysis. Most of the time that's what you're gonna have to do in order to get an accurate terminal multiple. Perpetuity growth method, the only subjective part is figuring out like what this what this number is, the growth rate. It's it's very difficult to put a pin on this site. You can't just justify 12% it's very difficult to say that companies are going to grow at 12%, you know, unless they're opening up. Even then. Um, but yeah. So, what is it? The Gordon Growth Model is a, I'm going to kind of back here. So, how would we find a company like this? There's, there's also this, uh, this assumption in accounting called, if I'm not mistaken, it's the, the going concern. Everybody in the market expects every single company to operate in perpetuity. It's never going to stop. This company will always be there. If that's the case, then what do future cash flows look like? What is normal for this business operating? Think of a Ford. Ford's been operating for 100 years. I doubt that they were calculating free cash flow back then, but I, I doubt that anybody thought back then that they would be leveled out to the way they are today. I, I guarantee that everybody back then thought that company would be booming like every year, no matter what. I, I, I guarantee everybody, everybody did not expect that company to, to, to taper out. So how do we put a, how do we figure that out? So the best way that I can basically put this for you is, imagine that, I'm gonna show you guys these stuff real quick. Imagine that we get down to free cash flow, right? We have year zero. And then we do the basic assumption, like forecasting baseline, the, the average compound annual growth rate. We get to year five, right? And we have year five free cash flow. What you do is you multiply that final year free cash flow by your terminal value, and then that's, that is of that year. And then you take that value and you discount it back to year zero today. And then you also discount the, the other periods, like year, years one through four, discount it back to year zero. That's your terminal value method. That's the best way I can put it to you. Terminal, the, the perpetuity growth method is you take year one, multiply by next year's growth, so one plus the growth, over this number right here is your WAC. It's your discount rate, because it's another way of saying WAC. <coughs> discount rate minus your growth. And that'll give you a justifiable valuation. Uh, so um, how does your terminal value differ from your enterprise value? Say again? How does terminal value differ from enterprise value? Like what's the difference? Between enterprise value and terminal value? Yeah. Terminal value is 
how much all future cash flows are from the last projection period. It isn't the, the ultimate valuation of that company, right? It's just the final year free cash flow. Like the, imagine like, let's just say year five has $100 in free cash flow. And then you do, let's just say it's 100,000. And then what normal valuation or what a normal uh, free cash flow would look like is, let's just say that the terminal value is 10X. Normal revenue would be 10 times 100,000. So one million. That's, that's that number. Enterprise value is you're taking the amount of equity, the market cap of the company, plus the net debt, which is all the debt you have outstanding, minus cash, preferred equity, and could be, oh, a non-controlling interest. So that's, if I were to buy the business, like I would be buying all that. And I'll be using their cash to pay down their debt. So that's how much I'd be paying. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's, that's the difference. But if you're so confused, like, no, that's good, thank you. Okay. Everybody got that? This is how we look in a model. Um, usually you do both. You do terminal value and perpetuity growth method. Uh, just because what you see is they're both very similar and they'll also both give you the same number. Just because if you think about it, it's like instead of starting today to find the perpetuity, like, um, like the, the infinite cash flows today, you're finding them at year five. And then you're discounting, with the terminal value method, you're discounting it back to the present day. That's, that's just the difference. That's why they give you such similar valuations. The only discrepancy is like those years one through five cash flows, that's where it differs. It's like, you're not taking that into account of the perpetuity growth method. Okay, so, Sorry, that was a lot. That's why we couldn't fail here. Um, what's the time value of money? That's something we haven't even talked about. Just kind of like a dollar now is worth more than a dollar in five years. Why? Because you can like reinvest that money right now. So if you like invest it at 7% every year, you're better off having a dollar now that's been invested compared to getting it a year later. Exactly. Time value of money, a dollar today is worth more than a dollar tomorrow. Fundamental principle you learn in accounting, finance, that's what we're doing here. We're taking future cash flows of what we're earning and finding out what it's worth today, the present value. Future value is that year five cash flow. Let's say we're trying to figure out what this is worth over here. You just, I, the opposite of discount. You, you, you discount it forward to find what's worth then. Do you guys think it'll be worth more in the future or worth more now? No. no. Any difference? Think about it. Imagine we're sitting in year two, right? This $28. If this goes back, it'll be worth less. But if this goes further, <coughs> then, the, then assuming that we invest that $28, it grows. So it'll be worth more. So to find what this is worth today, it'll be less because if we invest that amount, it'll grow to $28, okay? Right. Yeah, that's the enterprise value. This is what he was talking about. Um, the purpose of doing all that is to find your enterprise value. And when you do, you're trying to find your implied equity value. And also keep in mind, this is for public companies. You can't do this for startup. You're trying to find the implied equity value, and then you divide it by the shares outstanding, weighted average shares outstanding. Just, just share that standing to find what the implied equity value is. And then that's how you get what their implied intrinsic value is. And then also, a um, little note, mid-year convention, instead of just doing year one, year two, year three, and four and five in the future, that's kind of like a, an incorrect way to say that that's when they receive that $28. Because like I said, accrual counting, they receive cash at different times of the year. So you, to kind of guesstimate a, a correct way to where they find, um, where they generate that cash, you use the middle of the year. So instead of year one, you do year 0 0.5, year 1.5, 2.5, and so on. Another note I'll say is uh, over the summer, 
the, there's, a, there's another group in banking called like, the energy or the power utilities and infrastructure group. It depends which bank you're at. But their models, I swear to God, I think I saw one model that looks like 50 years in the future. 50 future year cash flows. And they discount all that back to today. Just imagine the nature of all those energy projects. You know, they're very long and strenuous. It's like, you're not gonna see a return on that investment today. That's why they're so long. That's another thing, like I said, to keep in mind the relative valuation framework. Not every company is gonna have the same forecast. So just keep that in mind. This is a DCF, typical DCF for fun. Pretty long, um, could be shorter. This is just a, a way to put it in one spreadsheet. You can put it into different sheets. But what are the pros and cons of this? Does anybody know, besides looking at this, how this might differ when you compare comparable analysis? What are the, what are the, the trade-offs? With the DCF, obviously, like, you, it's more sensitive toward your assumptions. I know that's listed as a con, so it can be more, like, specialized on your case as opposed to, like, the, like, for the more general brief case. Mm -hmm. uh, but then uh, on the negative side as well with the DCF is uh, a large part of your terminal value is just based on that on that, on, on that long-term growth rate, which is sort of just like the guesstimated number that you're kind of picking. So um, that, that is one of the, the big negative points. No, excellent point. It's very presumptuous, um, very subjective. You can say it, it seems objective, but really, you can see how you can start toying with the numbers to get the valuation that you want. And I'm gonna tell you guys, this is what a lot of professionals do. They try to move it just a little bit because they think that it's worth a little bit more. A lot of people in corporate finance do it. Um, it's kind of an unethical practice. But you try to, that's also one thing that I want to point out you guys in your internships. Try to guide those situations with a grain of salt. Don't try to be unethical because it's very easy to like, I've seen it. Like, it's very easy to just manipulate the numbers and make it seem that this company is worth more than what it actually is. Um, so yeah, very good points. It's very, very subjective and presumptuous. Um, but why is it, why is it good? Like, why is it, besides all that phonetic value, like, why is it actually like, a good way to measure a company's valuation? Because you can adjust for like a wide variety of factors when you build the DCF, right? Because oftentimes you're building the DCF by that like uh, via your like financial statements and via your revenue build model as well. So you can incorporate multiple assumptions that account for many moving parts in the company. Versus with the cost analysis, right? You're just taking like uh, like whatever, like the P multiple or your like EB to like EBIT the multiple and then multiplying by that. There you go. Yeah, a lot of levers you can pull if you actually like are a true investor and want to look at how this company moves with different assumptions. That's what you would do. You just Use your assumptions effectively. So it just gives you an exact number, so that you know, like, so that you can have a better understanding of the future, or the future outlook of that company, so that that can help you guide your decisions when you build that for like the industry. Yeah. Let me ask you guys something. Let's say you see a DCF, and then you see the the ultimate enterprise value or equity value coming out to a certain number. Let's just say enterprise value one million. As an investor. Are you going to pay that amount to buy that company? Like, are you going to, okay, like this is e-commerce, like I have to buy this company at this price. By law. Would you guys buy it? Um, no, because there's a lot of different factors, like goodwill, and good stuff like that. Yeah, a lot of intangible brand value attached to the business. So in that case, we would attach a premium to the company. Well, I, I'm so sorry, I'm really right. Okay, uh, yeah, basically a premium to the company. Uh, or a discount if you don't think it's valued at that state. Uh, sensitive to assumptions. And you're also assuming that the capital structure is right, assuming that they haven't taken out any debt or issue any more equity. 